Hey everybody, welcome back into this Photoshop tutorial brought to you as always by tutvid.com. It's part two, that's right, part two of what I believe is going to be a four-part series of 30 plus things, I think it's going to be about 36 things that you just have got to know how to do in Photoshop if you're a photographer. We're trying to cover everything out here and make things really nice and easy for you in Photoshop. If you enjoy the video, make sure you subscribe to my channel. If the button's over there, if it's over there, wherever it is, YouTube seems to be moving around a little bit lately. Uh, make sure you subscribe to my channel so you never miss another one of these video tutorials or any other Photoshop tutorial, any Lightroom tutorial or photography tutorials that are kind of coming in the future, but they are coming. And also, if you really, really enjoy the channel and you want to support what we're doing here, which, for which I would greatly thank you, uh, but if you feel so inclined, make sure you pick up a copy of my course all about how to retouch images in Photoshop. I think you're really going to love it, especially if you're a photographer and you're using some of the techniques we're using here in this tutorial. Uh, you're going to enjoy that, and you can feel good about supporting what we're doing here uh, at tutvid.com as well. That part of my job feels a little bit like begging, but now I'm going to start a given. And let's take a look at some other cool things that you just got to know how to do if you're a Photoshop, uh, if you're a photographer, that is, here in Photoshop. So I believe we're up to number 10. And what we're going to talk about today is the good old levels option, or really, as the professionals know it, the levels adjustment. We're going to use an adjustment layer since we already talked about them, and that's generally how I work. This is the levels adjustment here. We're going to click to add a levels adjustment layer. And here in the properties panel, we've got some interesting stuff, not least of which is this thing in the middle called a histogram. Now, if you don't know how to read a histogram, any image you open in Photoshop does have a histogram. You can go window histogram to open the histogram. And the basic way that a histogram works is all the way over here on the far left, that's the darkest stuff in the photo. So over here is the very darkest pixels, like the shadows on his jacket, the darkest parts of the grill of the car. And then all the way over here on the right, this stuff are the brightest parts of the image. At any point in this histogram, if it spikes all the way up to the top, so like if I take the white slider here on my levels adjustment, and I drag it way over and make this image like super duper bright, you can see that number one, the histogram looks very different, but most importantly, over here on the right side, look at how much white and bright stuff is in my photo. Most of the detail or the information in the image has been compressed into that little area, and I'm losing a ton of detail throughout the rest of my photo. In fact, all these gaps in my histogram are indicating that, look, there's just kind of like you're missing colors and tones, and, and I can tell that things are bad because I'm getting all kinds of crazy noise and artifacting here, especially in the dark parts of the photo. So this is just indicating the very brightest parts of the photo are left. So, you know, and if I do the opposite, where I take this back to being normal and I crank the blacks way up, you're going to see that this kind of the same thing happens, but in reverse, where it's telling me, look, you got a lot of dark pixels, a lot of black stuff in the photo. So when you have a spike on the very end, something that, like, that means it's a very blacks, and when it's all the way up to the top, it means there's parts of your image that are literally solid black. So if you were to print this photo, you would have entire areas of the photo that are totally devoid of detail. It would just be printed solid black ink on paper. So that obviously is not a good thing. So if we back our black slider off a little bit, hey, we still got some areas that are solid black. We really should take it back to where it was. And there we go. We control that black point and bring it down. But that's really how the histogram works. You got your dark stuff on the left side, the light stuff on the right side, and kind of the higher a spike is, the more of that color there is in your photo. So over here, we, we just have a lot of dark tones in this photo uh, overall. And sure enough, if you look at the photo, you would probably say like, yeah, there's probably more dark tones than light tones in this photo between the darkness and the grass and this bridge overpass and his jacket and his shadow on his skin and the shadow side of the car and the grill and the tires and everything. There's just a lot of dark stuff in this photo. So with a general idea of how to work with a histogram, it's a very non-scientific approach to the histogram. Let's take a look at what we can do here with levels. So first and foremost, we can straight up set a black point with the black eyedropper. So I can click this and say, look, yeah, right there on his jacket, if I click, that should be black. But you might be taken aback when you actually click because it doesn't make it solid black. In fact, if we took out the histogram, we get nothing solid black in the image. Because really, this isn't making it black. This is doing what's called setting a black point. So in theory, what this will have done is said like, all right, that's a part of the image that, that is a black point. We could take this and say like, all right, here's like the white point in the image. And it's going to 
in some sort of automatic way, try to adjust the white balance of the photo and color correct the photo. I honestly virtually never use those eyedroppers. Sometimes I'll use the eyedropper in the middle because that's the one you click uh, and use for just straight color correction where it's like, all right, this part of the photo should have no color cast in it. I'll click there and the photo should be color corrected. That obviously looks like it's very blue now. I'm just going to command or control Z to undo that. But there, there's some auto controls that you have with your eyedroppers. Again, I don't use them all that often. What What's more interesting here and what's going to get you going, especially if you're not too super familiar with levels, is just the fact that it's great contrast control. You can increase your blacks, you can increase the whites, and when you do that, it's going to provide a contrast boost for your image, just like that. Now, that's quite a bit too heavy, so we'll back that off. But you can also do something like drag the center point. If you drag it toward the black, you open up the whites, right, and therefore make your image brighter. If you drag it toward the white, you open up the blacks and, you know, increase the number of blacks in the image and make it, uh, make your image significantly darker. We also have the output levels here, which literally raises the black point or reduces the white point. So we could just take this and you can see this is what gives us almost that faded effect like you would see with an old Instagram filter or something like that or a Visco filter. And with the white, it's going to take all the white points and just tone them down, make them a little bit darker. Definitely tends to reduce the contrast of the image overall. So you'll probably need to combat it using some of these other parts of your levels dialog box here. And you can see there's before, there's after. We just tone down the highlights, but maintain the contrast in the photo. You do have some stuff here like, hey, go ahead and create your, you know, Photoshop. You do the best to do an auto correction. Again, I don't really use the auto features here in Photoshop. There are a bunch of presets in terms of like, hey, bright in the midtones or something like that. Uh, I'm going to undo that again. You do have this option down here as well, which just resets the levels dialog. And that's important because if you jump in here and start playing with like all the color channels and you make all kinds of crazy changes, right? And you've done this to like every color channel and you just quickly want to just, oh, I totally messed this up. You can hit the reset arrow and it just takes you right back to where the levels adjustment layer was when you initially added it to the photo. Now guys, before we wrap up with levels, I do just want to remind you if you're interested, make sure you pick up a copy of the course all about how to retouch images in Photoshop. I think you're really going to like it. Let's get back into it. So that's really pretty much levels. Like I said, you do have the option to get into color channels. We're going to talk more about the color channels in a minute when we talk about curves, uh, but I will just show you here in this little infographic that I put together. Uh, the basic way you can think about these colors, and this remains true all throughout Photoshop. Well, first of all, this is sort of like the dark side of levels. You drag and work with the darks and the shadows there, the highlights there. And then in the red channel, uh, red and cyan are opposites. So when you drag in one direction, you're going to get more red. When you drag in the other, you're going to get more cyan. Green and magenta are opposites. The same thing holds true. Drag to get green, drag to get magenta. And blue and yellow are opposites. So you drag to get a little more blue in the image or drag to get a little bit more yellow in the image. And with that knowledge, if you just remember like CMYK, so cyan, magenta, yellow, and RGB, so RGB, CMYK, they're all direct opposites. Red and cyan, green and magenta, blue and yellow. So they just kind of live together. If you remember this and memorize this, you'll have no problem playing with and mixing colors in Photoshop now or forever. Let's turn this on and take a look at curves. And here with curves, we're going to have much of the same thing, but this all really doesn't make sense because we need to open up a curves dialog box and take a look at curves for real. So here I've opened up a new photo and we're going to take a look at curves on this photo. So I'll add a curves adjustment layer, just like we did with levels, curves adjustment layer. And we have some of the same options here. We got these same uh, eyedropper tools. Again, here, sometimes I'll take the white balance tool and I'll say like, all right, this hub I think was supposed to be, you know, th there shouldn't be any color cast in that gray. Uh, th by the way, the, the auto eyedropper, it's particularly useful if you're using a gray card, whether you're shooting on location or shooting in studio. You can just take your auto color sampler, you click on that gray card, and you're going to have a properly color corrected image that quickly. That's really when that tool can be used the most effectively. But sometimes you'll know, like if a guy is wearing a, a white shirt, right, a collared shirt, and there's not really any reflected light that's hitting it, maybe he's not standing. If he's standing next to a yellow wall and there's naturally yellow light coming off of that wall, if you try to correct it then, the whole image is going to look kind of off balance. But if it's just a photo that falls in like, a, or, or uh, the shirt collar falls in sort of like a diffused highlight area where it doesn't have or shouldn't have much color contamination. Sometimes you can sample that and get like a really nice uh, selection. So, so, you know, if this, the hub of the car I know, or the side of this, uh, this uh, silver bumper was supposed to be gray and I can just click on it and say, oh, there we go. Now we've color corrected the photo. I'm going to undo that. We're not going to mess around with that. 
One of the cool things about the curve is it it's very different than levels. It's a little bit more advanced than levels, uh, but here's basically how it works. You can click to add a point to your curve at any point along the line. So if we drag up with the curve, we're gonna add brightness to the photo. We drag down, we add darkness. Now remember we talked about the histogram. You have this histogram behind here. So if we're saying like, all right, uh, the highlights of the photo are just too much. I would click and add a point there and like drag down to darken the highlights and then see I'm making the shadows darker as well, but I could drag a second point here and say, no, 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 you, you shadows, you know, come back up here and be a little bit brighter. And just like that, I tone the image down. I even remove some contrast and I get, you know, almost what looks like a much more movie-esque type photo just by adding that little wumpty wump debt there into my curve. To get rid of any one of these points, you click and drag and just drag it and rip it away from the line and your image will back to the way it is. Now, a couple cardinal sins that you want to avoid when you're working with curves. Number one, you don't want any downhill runs. When you have a downhill run, it's flipping or inverting those tones in the image. So in between this dot and that anchor point, we're flipping or inverting that part of the image. And those tones are the top part of the car and most of the stuff here in the tree. You can see how the colors are all messed up. The other thing you don't want to do is have an flat runs in your uh, in your curve wherever you have a flat run you have absolutely zero contrast so like right here I have this flat run you can see there's big portions of gray in my photo it's because total uh, an image with absolutely no contrast is just 50% gray in fact if I take this dot down here, which is the a absolute black point, and drag it halfway up the image, and take my absolute white point and drag it halfway down the image, you can see that all I have is solid 50% gray because we have an image with absolutely zero contrast. So with that knowledge, if the flatter the curve is, the less contrast it has, the steeper the curve is, the more contrast it would have. So if I pull down on my shadows, and this just makes sense, right? You make the shadows a little darker, you make the highlights a little brighter, and what do you do? You're adding contrast. Contrast. And sure enough, this center part of our curve here is steeper than the original line. And therefore, it's not it's not flatter. Remember, flatter means less contrast, steeper, more contrast. I'm going to hit the little reset button here. We got one of those here in curves as well. Now, that's not where the coolness of curves ends. A couple things. If you're still not comfortable working with the curve and uh, the histogram behind it, you have this little finger scrubby tool. So you can say something like, all right, the sky, we need to click and just drag that down. We need to darken the sky a little bit. But then, ooh, down here, the, the shadow side of the car just gets way too dark. Click and drag up with that, right? And you can see we create a curve kind of a lot like we had before when we were just kind of freehanding it. Uh, but this tool really will allow you to get in and, and selectively change the parts of the photo that you want to change. I'm going to reset this once more because we're going to jump into the color channels. So these color channels, it's exactly how they work with levels in terms of you pull up, what do we do? We add red. What's the opposite of red? Cyan. So if we pull down on red, we're going to introduce cyan. So we're getting this heavy cyan color cast. Really cool. I'm just going to drag that point away. Same thing for green. If we pull up on green, we're going to add a lot of green. We pull down on green, we add a lot of magenta. Now, how does all of this work? Well, it works very much the same way that the RGB composite channel does. In terms of with the blue, let's say we want to add blue to the shadows. Well, where are the shadows? According to our histogram, all of these blue tones are in our shadows. So we can just place a point down here and pull up and say like, all right, increase the blues there. But then we want to say throw yellow into the highlights. We would add a dot up here and pull down and we're going to be adding yellow into the highlights. And you can see we have this kind of like retro color effect where we've added blue to the shadows and yellow to the highlights that easily just going into the blue channel. And we know blue and yellow are exact opposites. And then if the client says, hey, um, I really want some like pink and, and maybe like a magenta basically in the shadows, we could say, all right, no big deal. We go to the green channel. We pull down down here in the shadows and we're adding magenta into the shadows. And if we want to make sure we're not getting any shadow in, or any magenta, magenta in the highlights, we can just drag the line back so it's kind of exactly where it was when the image began. So we're not really tainting the highlights with any kind of color, but we're just flooding those shadows with magenta. And if we really want to boost that, we can throw some red there in the shadows as well and just make sure we pull the rest of that curve back into line with where the original image was and just place as many points as we need to along there. And again, if I move this properties panel over to here, we can shut the curves off, turn them on, and you can see we've made a color and tonal change of the image with relative ease using curves. This is really an incredibly useful tool, especially when you're working on sunset photos, um, landscape photos in general. You're going to be able to do massive and sweeping contrast tonal color adjustments 
with curves uh, with relative ease. And the longer you use curves, the, the faster and faster you're going to get with it. It's just going to become like second nature. Oh, I need to brighten the highlights. I need to kind of bring the midtones down just a little bit. And I want to raise the black point to give myself this faded look. Boom. And just like that, you're going in and you've done exactly what you need to do. And you're able to do that because you know how curves works. The biggest problem with curves is usually people don't understand how it works. So you feel like you're, you know, reading a different language or something. But here again, if we go back to the infographic, let's take a look at this once more. This maybe will make more sense now. Of course, you pull up, you get brightness, you pull down, you get darkness, you pull up in the red channel, you get red, pull down cyan, and so on and so forth. So curves, the very powerful curves. It's maybe my favorite feature in all of Photoshop. I use curves so stinking much. It's an awesome tool, an awesome feature, an awesome adjustment that you have here at your fingertips in Photoshop. You can just do so much with curves. So let's talk about the 12th thing, and that is going to be blend modes. Let's jump back over here to this image. I'm going to dump my levels adjustment layer. Let's get a curves adjustment layer going here. And let's say we do, we want to boost the black point and then pull some darkness into the very shadows and then just kind of brighten the midtones a little bit and maybe pull, uh, pull the highlights down a little bit and then... Add, add a little bit of green into the shadows. So let's pull up on the green for the shadows. And overall, just introduce a little bit more yellow into the photo. Something like that. You can see there's before curves, there is after curves. We have this sort of like colorized effect we've added to this photo. Well, we have these things here called blend modes. And you can use a blend mode on any photo you like. So I'm going to just for the sake of the argument, I'm going to create a new layer. And I'm going to grab the brush tool. And I'm going to right click. And I'm going to make a nice large brush here. Maybe even larger than that. That, and I'm going to set the hardness to 100%. And I'm going to paint a big, just a big white dot out here, just like that. So the way blend modes work is they take whatever you have on your layer and they obviously, as you would expect based upon the name, they blend it with the layers beneath it. So I can say, take this from a normal blend mode to, it's kind of interesting the way the, the blend modes are broken down. So these five blend modes here, darken through darker color, these are all your darkening blend modes. So if I set this layer to multiply, you're going to see the white circle completely disappears because it can't really darken anything beneath it. Uh, so therefore, you're not really going to see anything. Even with color burn, you don't see anything. Uh, I'm going to go back to normal here. And maybe what we should do, let's set this to a color. I think setting this to a color will be a little bit more helpful. So I'm going to go image adjustments, hue saturation, and uh, we're going to tick on colorize. We're going to make this a little darker. We're going to boost the saturation quite a bit. And let's make this just like blue or something, right? And go ahead and hit OK. Cool. So now here, if I set this to multiply now, you're going to see it, it darkens the whole the whole thing because my, the blue circle is interacting with what is underneath it, but it's darkening everything. And color burn is kind of a more extreme version of that. So all of these blend modes are really helpful. So we've got kind of our darkening blend modes. Then here, lighten through lighter color. These are our lightning blend modes. If I go screen, you can see I really get this light blue now. And color dodge is a more extreme and punchy version of that. And so on and so forth. And then these, uh, these blend modes here are kind of like tonal. Um, I would describe them as kind of the tonal blend modes. If we go overlay, overlay, this tends to take like the contrast, really mix and boost the contrast uh, between the layers. In fact, if we take this curves adjustment layer and we set it to a blend mode of overlay, you're going to see it's really going to increase the contrast. Soft light is like a softer, more usable version of overlay. You can see it just kind of takes the harsh edge off it. It's still way too much, but at this point we would probably use the opacity slider and tone back our effect a little bit, just like that. I'm going to turn the blue circle back on. We have stuff like hard light, which you're not going to see a huge difference, but it is definitely changing things up in there. And vivid light and linear light, all these different blend modes, they do all different things. Soft light and overlay are probably the two you're absolutely going to use the most. And multiply and screen as a photographer you use uh, a little bit as well. Difference, exclusion, subtract, divide, these has to have to do with kind of working with the color and tone of the photos. Uh, difference you're going to see, it's just going to, it almost inverts the color underneath, but through the color on the top. Uh, and exclusion does some weird stuff. If it's super gray and all kinds of things. You'll use these in very specific applications. These are not going to be blend modes you go in and say like, ooh, is this going to take my photo over the top? And then stuff like hue and saturation and color luminosity. Hue, saturation, color, they all have to do with applying the color. So if I say hue, it's going to take my blue and just paint that blue on the underlying photo and just replace the hues of the photo beneath it. So I can drag it over here to the grass and it's going to replace the hue of the grass. Color will replace the hue and the saturation. So now it's going to make everything blue but a very bright blue blue. Uh, saturation, uh, well, you can see it's just going to boost the saturation level of the underlying image to the saturation level of my circle, which is obviously a great bit, uh, a great deal uh, 
higher than the original image. And luminosity will take the underlying image and, and kind of boost the luminosity of it based upon the layer you have on top. So again, you're probably not going to use a lot of these. Hue and color tend to be useful if you're changing the color of you know clothing or cars or just objects in general. They can be really, really useful. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to be working with overlay, soft light, multiply, and screen. Those are the big ones. And you just know multiply. That's going to be like your darkening blend mode. Screen will be a brightening blend mode. And overlay and soft light will allow you to sort of blend images together and increase contrast and fun stuff like that. I'm going to set my opacity back to 100%. And I'm going to go back to a blend mode of normal. So speaking of blend modes and changing the color of objects and stuff like that, let's let's change the color of this girl's top here. And we want to take it from being bright pink to, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll pick some color when the time comes. But we're going to do this uh, using a combination of adjustment layers, blend modes, and masking. This is where we're going to talk about masking, which is super important. And we're going to try to breeze through this pretty quickly uh, because a crash course on masking is kind of the best. You really got to get out and try masking and use it for yourself. So the idea is we need to make her shirt, not pink, but some other color. So what we'll do is we will create a new adjustment layer. In fact, to have some fun with it, we'll use a levels adjustment layer. I'll go to the blue channel and let's drag, hmm, which direction? Maybe we'll drag some blue into this, something like that. And we'll go to the green channel and whoop, we'll drag some kind of purple. Eh, no, probably not purple. We'll drag, I don't know. There's just a, a bunch of different colors into here until we're getting a top of her shirt that looks uh, quite a bit different than what she had. All right, so now we're heading in the, the blue direction. That's probably fine. Something like that is great. Now, the problem here is pretty obvious, right? The entire image is blue-green and not at all what we want. So we need to use something called a mask. Now, all of your adjustment layers come with a mask automatically, but let's say you have a layer that doesn't have a mask. I mean, yeah, I want to delete the layer mask. Uh, maybe it's this image or, or th this layer, excuse me. If you don't have a layer mask, all you need to do is come down to the bottom of the layers panel and choose the Create New Layer Mask button. It's going to give you that layer mask right there. There, excuse me. Now, here's how a layer mask works. When the layer mask is white, everything on the layer is visible. If I fill this layer mask with black, so I set my foreground color to black, right? I'm use those little swippy swap arrows there. My foreground color is black. I use the hotkey option delete. That'd be alt backspace on the PC. It fills my mask with black. What happens? The entire effect disappears. Now here's where it gets fun. We can grab the brush tool. We can paint with the brush tool. We can say, hey, set our foreground color to white with the brush tool. I paint a big white square over her and you can see in the mask, big white square right there. And that's the only part of the effect that's showing through. Think of it like a ski mask, right? These are the eye holes and this is the mouth hole, right? They're the only holes in the mask and therefore all that blue effect is pouring through there. I'm going to undo those. We don't want that. We're going to zoom in here on her shirt once more. And what we want to do is go ahead and paint over her shirt using the brush to reveal this blue color effect. So I'm going to right click here. We're going to make our brush a little smaller and I'm going to make it a nice soft brush. And we'll begin painting here over her shirt. I'm actually going to make the brush a little bit smaller. And we'll just go ahead and paint over her shirt. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be pretty rough about it because we want to get this finished. And I'm going to cut in here. One of the great things you can do when you're masking is hold down the letter R and it will give you the spring loaded tool, which is the rotate tool. So you can rotate so you can keep painting along, you know, whatever is easiest. I find that painting up and down for me is the easiest way to get a great selection relatively quickly. And if we paint out over her neck and upper chest area, we can just switch our foreground and background colors hitting the letter X, paint with black. And when you paint with black, you're going to hide some of that effect. Now we're back to painting with white. We can just reveal. I'm just trying to get a nice little edge here. So I'm going to speed the video up again here in a second, and we will be back in just a moment. And once we've finished painting, we can just go bring up the rotation tool by hitting the letter R and choose to reset the view. It's going to bring us exactly back to where we need to be. And you can see the shirt is now blue. And that's actually a pretty realistic looking blue, right? And if we alter option click on our mask over here in the layers panel, we can alter option click. We can just make sure that everything is filled in. See how we can see little areas we missed. So we can grab the brush tool. We're painting with white here. We can just paint over these areas just to make sure everything is exactly 100% consistent as we need it to be. You can see any little areas, any nick areas that we missed we can go in and just make sure that they're looking the way they need to look alter option click on the layer mask again to get out of that alpha channel viewing mode i'm going to zoom in actually just a little bit here maybe a little bit more and uh one of the other things you can do is you can shift click on the mask to temporarily disable it and you can see now our blue is spilling out all over everything and boy what a difference that makes right 
Now it does not look realistic at all, but we shift click to constrain it to just the shirt and it actually looks pretty stinking realistic. Now we can also, if we decide this blue is not quite right, we can try changing the blend mode, maybe setting it to soft light. And you can see that doesn't really do what we want it to do. We could try color and that gives us one effect. We could try hue. That gives us a little bit of a different effect. That's actually probably the most realistic of all of them. And that looks like she had a blue blouse on instead. In fact, we could do something like try to match it to the tips of her arrows there. We can do something fun like that. Now that we have a layer mask, check this out. We can command or control click the layer mask to load that as a selection. Let's just hide our levels adjustment here. And with, with a selection active, if you add an adjustment layer, like hue saturation, let's say, it's going to automatically create a mask using that selection. So now the only area that's going to be affected by this hue saturation is the white area in our mask. So if I go ahead and start shifting the hue, you can see, look at what it's doing. It's just changing the color of the shirt. And now the shirt is more purple, kind of like the tips of the arrows. Maybe brighten it up just a little tiny bit. Change the purple a tiny, tiny bit. Something like that. You know, maybe it actually needs to be a little bit darker and a little bit less saturated. Something kind of like that looks pretty good. And now the purple of her shirt kind of matches the purple of her arrows, right? We just did that with hue saturation nice and easily, and we got the mask to exactly match. There's a shirt before, there's the shirt after, and of course, there's the blue shirt. So masking, super duper duper powerful. You're going to use it, whoops, you're going to use it all the time when you're working in Photoshop, and it's something you want to play with and use and use and use and get used to using it. And just you'll learn how to use masking more and more and more and become more and more comfortable with it, uh, with it the more that you use it. So let's move on to number 14. And this is going to be all about how to retouch eyes. So let's talk about how to retouch eyes. This is the 14th thing. Like I said, uh, this is my friend Sarah we've brought in here. And I'm going to show you just a very basic eye retouch that you're going to be able to do very quickly and very easily to almost any image. Now, there's lots of different ways to retouch eyes. The number one cardinal rule, at least in my book, is really try not to over retouch eyes because then they start to look really, really bad. Um, now we probably would get these flyaway hairs out of her face, all kinds of things like that. But for now, we're just going to focus on the eyes. Here's the basic lowdown on how I typically will begin my eye retouching. It starts with two curves adjustment layers. One, two. I take the top curves adjustment layer and I set this to the blend mode of color dodge. And you can see it's going to make my image very bright. So what am I going to do? I'm going to select the layer mask. I don't want to see it. So what will I do? I'll fill it with black. Well, what's the opposite of black? The opposite of black is white. So we can go image adjustments invert, but note the hotkey command or on the PC control and the letter I, I for invert. So if we select the layer mask at command or control I, we fill it with black, therefore hiding all of that color dodge light explosion. Let's select the layer on the bottom. We're going to set this one to color burn. It's going to extremely darken the image. We're going to select the mask once again, command or control I. Now for this, you really want to zoom way in on the eyes. We're going to grab the brush tool and I'm going to right click on the brush tool and I want to have a very, very small brush, maybe like five pixels. And I want it to be very soft. So a hardness of 0% is perfect. Now up here in my top control bar, I like to set the opacity of the brush. This is not the opacity of the layer. It's the opacity of the brush. I like to set it to 10. So I just hit the number one and you can set it to 10. We're painting with our foreground color here set to white. And what I'm going to do is we're on the color burn layer. So as we paint with white very subtly here on this mask, we're going to just darken up parts of the eye. I want to darken up around the colored part of the eye. I want to make her eyelashes probably a little bit thicker and heavier, right? Just make that upper eyelid in general a little bit heavier. We can make a brush a little bit bigger using the right bracket key and paint into the very middle of her eye, make that a little darker, and then paint around the edges of the eye just a little bit just to increase the shadow on the edges. You want to be very careful with that though because if you go too extreme painting in shadows on the eye, you really tend to make it look like people's eyes are popping out of their head in a not very attractive way uh, unless you're, you know, like retouching the eyes of a chameleon or something. Uh, let's go ahead and darken up these eyelashes. And again, we'll darken around the inside and outside of the iris here. So just add a little bit of darkness and then darken up in the very, very middle of the eye, just something like that. So if we shut off that curves adjustment layer, you can see there's before, there's after. We're just adding that darkness. Now I'm going to come up to my color dodge layer. This is my brightening layer. And I'm going to add a little bit of brightness to the whites of the eyes, just a little bit. And then I'm going to add brightness, particularly to the bottoms of the colored portions of the eye. And it really is just going to bring out depth and detail uh, in her eyes. It's really, really nice. And we are intentionally going over the top because we're going to re reduce both the color dodge and color burn layers using opacity. This also could be a good time if somebody has very glossy lips. You can go in and just accentuate the highlight on their lips as well. Uh, because again, we're going to be toning all of that back. 
All right, so there we go. And what I would do now is use my opacity slider and just simply slide this back to something around like, I don't know, 50% or so. So there's before, there's, whoop, there's before, there's after. And then we'll do the same thing with the shadows. There's before, uh, there's, well, there's before, I'm sorry, and there's after. So if we zoom out a little bit, there her eyes are with a simple retouch. We can shut those two curves layers off. There it is straight out of the camera. And there it is just accentuating them a little bit. Again, we're not trying to go over the top. If we were to duplicate these layers a bunch of times, you can see very quickly you get just this really not such a good look is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, so and not such a good look is not as good as like a nice and just kind of subtle little pop for the eyes. So next up, and for number 15, we're gonna talk about whitening teeth. Now this is pretty straightforward, but it actually works for whitening teeth and also whitening the whites of the eyes. Now, she doesn't have any problem here with the whites of her eyes, but her eyes are so white, it's really contrasting against the fact that her teeth, they just appear very yellow in this photo. How do we fix that? Well, it's actually a pretty simple fix. You use your vibrance adjustment layer. The vibrance adjustment layer is way up in the top right corner and reduce vibrance. I tend to like to reduce vibrance pretty extreme, you know, negative 50, negative 60. And then what we'll do is we'll select that layer mask and command or control I to fill it with black. I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to take my brush tool, so our brush tool we're just using on the other model's eyes, right click, maybe make it a little bit bigger, bring it up around 20 or so. And I'm going to set the opacity of the brush now to something more like 30 or 40%. So let's, let's hit the number four. That'll bring us up to 40%. We're painting with white. So we're going to paint a little bit of white here over her teeth and it's going to reveal some of that vibrance layer and therefore neutralize some of that yellow that is appearing there in her teeth. The trick with whitening teeth is you really don't want them to look solid white because solid white is not very realistic because that's not the color of even very, very white teeth in real life. So I'm gonna go over these teeth with another pass here at 40% opacity with my brush. And we can just, you know, keep an eye on how the teeth are looking and just make sure we, we help to neutralize the yellow color uh, without making the teeth so unnaturally white that it appears uh, like there's something strange going on there. So there it is before our vibrance adjustment layer, right? You see that? And there it is after our vibrance adjustment layer. So we really did a lot for her. We cleaned up the, the teeth. We, made, we took away that kind of yellow tinge that was there before, after, before, after. Really nice. And you could do the same thing for her eyes if her eyes were not already as white as they are. Sometimes people have a lot of blood vessels or a little bit of jaundice in their eye. You can get rid of that. Uh, using the same kind of vibrance adjustment layer, mask it. And the trick is use your brush, but don't have it set to 100% opacity. Go with an opacity of like 20, 30, 40% and do multiple passes if you have to. You get a, a huge amount of control uh, and you can really dial in a nice effect there like we did, just cleaning up her teeth and it's a really, really fast effect. So the next and the 16th thing that I wanna talk about is changing hair color. Um, and ironically, about the time this tutorial will be coming out, I'll have a couple tutorials coming out just dedicated solely to changing hair color. But let's just talk about it really quickly here uh, in the heat of the moment. Now, disclaimer, she does have blonde hair and blonde hair might be the easiest of all types of hair to change color. A very dark black and very dark brown are more difficult. The key is though with any photo, you just need a lot of detail in the hair. If you don't have good light and detail in the hair, you're never gonna get a realistic color change. So here we've got plenty of light falling into her hair. We do have a shadow underneath there, but I think this will work out just fine. What I wanna do because this hair is going to be kind of difficult to select and we're not really getting to advanced selection techniques, we're gonna use something called quick mask and it's this little option down here. Now I want you to double click on that icon before we get started and make sure that selected areas is ticked on. That just means that when we paint the areas that we actually paint, those are gonna be the areas that are converted to a selection. Masked areas does the opposite of that, and it's kind of like a funky way to paint, at least to me. So I'm gonna choose selected areas, and I'm just painting with the color red, that's fine. Grab the brush tool, and you can see we're in quick mask mode because it, the button is active like that. We wanna make sure the opacity of our brush is back to 100%, and we're gonna paint with a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a larger brush. So we're gonna just make this a little bit bigger, so we'll boost the size. Yeah, something right about there is fine and we're just gonna begin painting. Now our foreground color is set to black, and I'm just gonna very roughly go over her hair and attempt to paint over it. Like I said, this is not at all the best way to select something like hair, but we're not getting into select and mask and some of the more advanced selection techniques in this, in this video. We'll do that in probably the next part and third part of this little uh, photographers and using Photoshop and things that you really ought to know uh, course or, or mini series, maybe I should say, mini series here on YouTube. All right, let's paint this. I'll probably speed this up here, just rip through this really quickly and get, you know, somewhat of a workable selection finished up and ready for us.
All right, so there we go. Something like that. It's an, a very rough selection, uh, but once again, not the greatest way to make a selection of hair, but we're not. We're, we'll get into that later. Hit the letter Q, and it's going to take your painting and convert it to a selection. All right now, remember, like we learned, if we uh, add a, an adjustment layer when we have a selection active, well, it creates a mask automatically for us. So I think I'm going to use something like the curves adjustment, right, because we already learned about curves. And let's say we uh, the client says, hey, look, take your hair from being blonde. We want it to be more like brunette. So we could say, all right, we'll pump some red into this hair. We probably need to make it a little darker. So we'll go to the RGB composite channel. We'll make it a little bit darker, something like that. Uh, we'll pump a little bit of magenta into it. We we'll probably have a little bit too much red in there, to be honest. Let's pull some of that red out of there. Um, and maybe put some blue into there, just to, oh, no, that makes it really look pink. Uh, we'll put yellow into there. There we go. See, now it's looking kind of like brownish red. All right, it's looking more like very, very auburn colored. Uh, but we could try doing something like setting the blend mode to something like multiply. And you can see now she's got very brown hair that actually does not look all that great. Um, but we'll just reduce the opacity a little bit. And maybe what we'll do is just command or control click on this layer mask and add a vibrance adjustment layer above this and just reduce the vibrance of the hair a little bit, something like that. And maybe command or control click again, add another curves adjustment layer and just darken the hair one more pass, something like that. It looks pretty good. We'll go back to the vibrance. Uh, layer and reduce the vibrance a little bit more and you can see I mean obviously we need to clean up the edge of the mask there on her forehead it looks like she has a little bit of a, a colored wig or something on but we've gone from if I hold down alter option and click on the eyeball for the original layer there was her blonde hair and there is her more brunette brown hair maybe there's a little bit too much red and pink in there courtesy of this curves uh, adjustment layer here but that's that's what we're targeting with this vibrance layer see I take that away and it's got a ton of color so very quickly you can adjust the color of hair but you just need to create a mask and ideally or for the most part I like to work with curves adjustment layers brighten or darken if need be and then just begin adding different colors pump a little red in there maybe it doesn't need red at all maybe you really should be taking red out in fact actually look at that if I take red out that really Really does a lot if instead of I say hey maybe it needs a little cyan not too much cyan because we don't want we don't want it to start looking green or blue but that actually looks really good if I take the red out entirely it looks much more like brown hair again the thing that's tripping everyone out or, or is going to look weird is that heavy edge there where it's bleeding out over her skin but that's really uh, due to the bad selection and not due to the adjustment layers here so we went in relatively quickly and we changed the color of her hair and this is the general technique for most of of what you do, whether you're working with blonde or brunette or red or white or gray hair, you go in, you start adding color, mix it up with your blend modes. We talked about the blend modes. If something is to be darkened or brightened, if you need to reduce opacity, we know how to do all that stuff. So you begin using the tools and, and, and kind of build your own recipe and we can convert our hair color from blonde to a brunette. So now for number 17, let's talk about a method of cleaning up blemishes from the skin called frequency separation. And this is particularly useful because it, it allows you to split the detail in your image away from the color and work on one or the other to really get the best possible skin tones and skin retouching uh, that you can in your image. And here's basically how it works. The way I like to work with it is duplicate a couple copies of your image. So Commander Control J once, twice, and uh, let's just rasterize these layers. We're going to right click rasterize layer, right click rasterize layer, keep things nice and simple. We're going to name the lower layer here low and we're going to name the higher layer here high and uh, high is going to contain our details, low is going to con contain our color information. I'm going to shut off the high layer and with the low layer I'm going to go filter, blur, Gaussian blur and for the most part there's not really a right or wrong Gaussian blur. It all depends on the size of your image and just how much of the actual image your subject is sort of taking up. You just need enough of a Gaussian blur to just blur away all the details. So you're just kind of, you can see we can't see any of her skin texture anymore. It's just all smooth color from one thing to the next. Maybe we'll push this up to like 15, uh, but yeah, eh, 15 might even be too much. Let's go down to like 12. There we go, something like that will definitely work. Go ahead and hit okay. So for this, 12 pixels worked. For your image, maybe five will work or maybe 50 it's gonna take. It really all just depends on how big or small your photo is. Uh, let's come up here to high and we're gonna turn the high layer on and we're gonna come up here to image and apply image. And what I wanna do is apply the high layer to the low layer. So I'm gonna say, oh, go ahead and apply that to the low layer. We're gonna use the blending mode subtract. That's a new one, right? Subtract and we want the scale to be two and the offset to be 128. This is typically what's gonna work for just about any image. I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. And you can see, oh no, what have I done? Looks a little weird. 
But don't worry, this is the details of the image. Remember, underneath we have all the colors, they're all blurred out. This is all of the detail of the image. What we can do here is set this layer to the blend mode of linear light, and it's going to make it look exactly like our image. So it's right back to looking like our original image. See, there's the original image, and here are the frequency separated layers with detail up top and color information down here on the bottom. Part of the great advantage of this is if we zoom in, we have a lot of different blemishes here we can get rid of on her face, and we can do that relatively easily up here on the high layer. So what I can do is come over and grab like my healing brush. I'm gonna go with the actual healing brush, and I'm gonna choose to make sure it's sampling just the current layer. So we're just working here on our high layer, sampling these details and getting rid of stuff we need to get rid of. So I'm gonna hold down Alter Option, and I'm gonna sample the detail there, and I'm gonna cover up that little blemish, and I can cover up like that line across her forehead, and I can get rid of this line very easily across her forehead, and get rid of this line down here very, very easily. And you can just go through and very quickly clean up an image. We can go in and get rid of the hair here that is crossing through her eyebrow. And you can see it's just, it's so fast and so easy. The colors aren't really mixing. We just have our textures. Whoop, that texture is not the same. You gotta make sure that you do sample kind of the same texture, otherwise it's gonna be a very obvious, uh, obvious heel as you saw there. Let's go in and try to heal that away a little bit, the hair. You gotta be very careful and deliberate in tight areas. There we go, something like that. We can just kind of spread that out a little bit. So just kind of blend it in a little. That looks good. Uh, we can go ahead and get rid of this blemish on her nose, this hole here, probably an old nose piercing or something. And you know, we could even do something uh, drastic, like down here on her arm, she has this bit of tattoo hanging out here. We could heal over that. Now it's not gonna get rid of it entirely because we have all of the darkness of the underlying color, right? We're just getting rid of the detail portion of it. In fact, I'll get rid of that little speck spot there. And then we would come down to the low layer, and here on the low layer, we could go ahead and heal. So I'll start here probably from this edge. I'll make my healing brush a little bit larger. And we can go in and we would paint away uh, the color so we can try to kind of blend the skin together. You can see we're gonna get a little bit of haloing. Um, so we, we really need to create a little bit of a selection along that edge. But you could go in and begin, whoop, wrong layer, down here on the low layer, we could go in and begin using the same color here along the edge of the arm and just start clearing away everything we can and we just won't be able to get it exactly perfectly to the edge um, unless we go in and make a bit of a selection. Uh, but you know, that you would have to do either way. So we're able to go in and do that. But more importantly here down, down on the low layer, if we wanted to kind of start flattening the tones in the image, you can see her face appears very, very shiny. You could do something like take your brush, uh, right click, make the brush very large, a little bit larger than that, and very soft, and set the opacity of the brush to like 10%. Uh, we could use our eyedropper tool. So just hold down your alter option key, grab the eyedropper tool and grab a tone that's right next to like the very bright tones. I'm down here on the low layer and we could just paint over these very, very bright tones. And it's just gonna help kind of soften the image a little bit. And then we could pick from the lighter tones and paint over some of the shadows to kind of brighten them up a little bit. And you could just go through the image and just kind of, you know, kill off a little bit of that really harsh contrast that you have if you do have really harsh contrast running through your image. So here we can take from the light tones in her arm, paint along the dark area, take from the dark tones, paint along the light area. And you can see there's her arm before, there's her arm after. And really where we'll see the differences up here in her face. There's before frequency separation, there's after. So we've really started flattening everything out and we started removing some of the blemishes. But the blemishes, you know, you just gotta go in and, and work at them and get rid of all of them. And it's just a little bit of time and, and you'll have all these blemishes gone before you know it. So frequency separation, it's a super great way to go in and heal skin and to clean up blemishes, especially, you know, pretty big blemishes that would be really, really difficult to get rid of. Um, and actually, I should show you two quick things with frequency separation here. One of the things you can do is you can sharpen the details up on their own layer here. So we could go like filter, sharpen, smart sharpen, and we could apply some sharpening just to the details of the image at this point if we wanted. Um, and we're going to get like a really strong kick of sharpening, uh, 100%, the radius of 8.3 is just absurd. So let's bring the radius to more like one and a half or two and reduce noise is maybe a little high. Let's just get rid of reduce noise. And you can see what we've got. If I shut preview off, there's before. Can you see the difference there? I mean, just like watch up here in the highlight on her forehead. There's before, 
and there's after. It just really makes all that stuff jump so much. In fact, I probably would want even less sharpening than that. And then I'll just hit OK. So you can sharpen up there on that layer. But also, if you do sharpen and you decide, you know what, the skin now is too crunchy, we can add a layer mask and you can go over the skin with the brush tool. And by the way, this is a method that is highly frowned upon by uh, many retouchers out there. But again, I just want to you know, know the rules so you know when to break them because maybe there's a time when you'll find you can use this. Uh, I like to take a large soft edge brush, opacity of just 10% and you'll paint with black so black should be the foreground color and when you hide the details layer so I'm painting just a very little bit of black you can see if I alter option click on the mask to bring up the alpha channel it's just very light gray so it's just hiding this details layer a very little bit what we're doing is actually applying just a tiny bit of blur to the skin and of course the reason that's bad is because when you apply blur you are getting rid of sharpness and detail um, and there's almost never a time when you want to do this the reason that I'm just showing you this technique is because of another technique that I'm going to show you, and it's actually going to be the 18th thing that we cover, and that is when you do smooth skin out, how to rebuild skin texture or add a little bit of skin texture where there is none. See how soft this looks? If I shift click the mask, there it is. See all the detail that we get rid of? There it is when we mask. There it is without the mask. All right, so I'm shift clicking the mask. All right, so we're on to 18. This is building skin texture um, and kind of creating some finishing grain to help if you decide you want to smooth skin out like this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new layer. I'm going to call this skin uh, texture. There we go. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to go edit fill and we're going to fill this layer with 50% gray. So from the contents drop down menu 50% gray and hit OK. Then we're going to go filter noise and we're going to add noise. Now I'm looking to add a reasonable amount of noise, not too much. Eh, some, something like 10 might be good. We might want to go a little higher, maybe like 15. Yeah, let's go 15. I'm going Gaussian, and this is kind of important. We want to make sure monochromatic is checked on. That means we're not going to get any color. See how there's all kind of that, that purple and green and blue in there? We want to make sure monochromatic is checked on. That way it's just black, white, gray. We can control this. And the nice thing about this is we once again can use a blend mode, and a blend mode here is going to be soft light. And you're going to see what this is going to do is it's going to apply this heavy grain over our image, but what it tends to do is smooth all of these tones. See, there it is before the grain, there it is after. Now, obviously, there's way too much grain, uh, but this is one way to add grain and smooth your image a little bit in terms of all the tonality, and you would reduce the opacity down to like 30 40%, something like that. Uh, but this is not really adding the texture we want to the skin. How can we build actual skin texture? Let's crank this back up to 100%. In fact, let's set this back to a blend mode of normal so we can get a good idea of what's happening here. Uh, we're going to shut this layer off for a second. Let's take a look at our photo. The light is coming from over here, camera right, it's coming down and hitting her face, and there's a little bit of an edge light back here, camera left, that's hitting the side of her hair. We don't need to be worried about that so much. But the shadows on her face, if I create a new layer here and grab my brush tool, and uh, I can go ahead and just show you. The shadows on her face that are coming off her nose are down here. See that, the shadow, the shadow here, shadow underneath her eye, shadow underneath her eye, right? So this is all the highlight over here, but these bits are the shadow. So that's important because we're going to go ahead and create the skin texture and we want it to follow the highlight and shadow pattern in the photo already. Let's turn our noise layer back on. We're going to go filter, stylize, and choose emboss. Now you can see here with the embossing, we have a highlight and a shadow. In fact, I'm just going to zoom in on this. A uh, height of three pixels is usually great. Maybe sometimes you might just want to go with two. Two actually might look better, right? That looks very much like skin texture, right? An amount of 100% looks great for this photo. And the angle is just about right. Maybe we'll take it more to like 54, all right? And you can see we're getting our highlight up here on the top part of our, our little bumps and the shadow is going to be on kind of like the bottom left. So top right is where the light's coming from. Maybe we'll set this to more like 65 degrees. That looks good. Hit OK. And we're going to set this to a blend mode of, we could go with overlay. Overlay is a little bit more severe. Soft light's a little bit kind of, you know, just gentler. I think I'll go with soft light. I'm going to zoom out. And what we want to do is create a mask, but we want, let's just fill it with black right off the bat. If you hold down your alter option key and choose the new mask button, boom, a new mask, but it's filled with black. All right, so now we're going to zoom in on her skin. We're going to grab our brush tool. We're going to set the brush tool up here, the opacity, whoop, wrong tool. We're going to set the opacity of the brush tool to 10% by hitting the number one. And we want to make sure our foreground color is white. So go ahead and hit the letter D. It's going to restore default colors and use your bracket keys to make your brush larger or smaller. And now we're just going to begin painting in that texture very lightly wherever we think we need it. 
So I can go over this model. I can just add a little bit of skin texture just so it really does not look like we went and blurred her skin. This is going to allow us to really get rid of a lot of original um, blemishes and defects in her skin. You can obviously set your foreground color to black anytime you need and, and just kind of tone back some of that skin texturing if it needs to be toned back. And I can come down here to her arm as well. And I can just paint some of the skin texture there into her arm uh, as well. And again, we're just making sure if we need to paint with black and get rid of a little bit of it, we can always do that as well. So that is how you can go in and create new skin texture uh, where there was none before. If I shut the skin texture layer off, there's before and there's after. So we've gone in and we've just added some skin texture and it's perfect skin texture. It's symmetrical skin texture um, and it looks pretty good, especially on beauty projects. It looks really, really nice, uh, but it can be useful for all sorts of things. Uh, but aside from the skin texture, just remember that a lot of times if you're looking to just smooth tones and colors overall in your photo, get rid of banding, anything like that, adding a layer of grain and setting it to soft light just by itself and reduce that opacity a little bit, you can get great results helping to smooth your images out and have just, you know, nicer photos overall. There's a reason that a lot of retouchers will use finishing grain. It's not to add some sort of hipster Instagram type grain effect. It's because grain actually helps you smooth the transition between tones uh, in digital images uh, like this one. So guys, my friends, my people, that was a little exhausting. I feel like that took a really long time. Um, but that is going to be the conclusion of part two. We're 18 steps in, and we've got probably about 18 more to go. So I think about two more videos of this course, and we'll be wrapping it up. We're going to go through well over 30 things that as a photographer I think you should know how to do that are just going to help you up your game a little bit. I think you'll find this stuff super duper 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 useful. If you've enjoyed this video, like I mentioned before, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you never miss another Photoshop, Photography, Lightroom, or other video tutorial brought to you by this channel. If you feel so inclined, make sure you follow me on Instagram as well, at tutvid is my name. There's, we're moving into a new studio space. There's going to be lots of cool behind-the-scenes stuff coming in addition to lots of just tutorial-related stuff, graphic design and photography and video and all sorts of cool stuff. Well, we all live in that realm, right? And for, well, the next nine things that every photographer really ought to know how to do in Photoshop, including but not limited to levels, curves, masking, blend modes, frequency separation, and more. That's it. Get it? Got it? Good. Nathaniel Dodson, tutvid.com. I'll catch you in the next one.